Well, I am very excited to be here and to meet all of you. I have been writing poems since I was like five or six. I don't have any memory of writing poems when I was five or six, but I was home and my stepmother wanted me to clean out my room so she could use it for something else. And so, because I don't live there anymore, and I went through and I was like, oh my goodness, here I am writing these poems. And I was like, wow, and you write when you're a girl and then you write when you're all grown up. And um, I think it's just great to, that you're all writing now and making that a part of your lives because um, I think it's sort of a way to be with yourself that in, especially when you're teenagers, you're not really with yourselves. You're always with friends and doing other things. Um, and then when you're adult, you're not really with yourself that much either. And then you have kids and then you're never alone with yourself. <laughs> so I love getting to write poems and to, to read them. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, and another thing I do, which I, I brought copies, is that I translate poems. Um, so uh, I lived for some years uh, in Chile and then I also lived in Brazil. So um, I'm going to read a couple poems that I have translated by a Brazilian poet. Do any of you speak Portuguese or Spanish? Anyone here sp speak Spanish? Portuguese? Spanish, but I'm French Portuguese. Ah. My dad is born. But we'll say fala português, no? A little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, those of you in, 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 in what? Oh, I wish I had it. Para bens. <laughs> um, so, você conhece o irmão de barro? Ah, yeah. É maravilhoso, não? Sorry, we're having a private presentation. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so, so, wait, wait, what's your name? Georgia. Georgia. Can you tell us a little bit about the Pantanal, where he comes from? Okay, um, yeah. he comes from, like, Cuiabá. Yeah. Uh, it's actually close to where we're born. It's super hot, like, all the way hot. Yeah. Yeah, so he comes from this sort of swamp region where it rains and rains and rains and rains and rains and you just have to put on a giant net and hope the mosquitoes don't get under it. <laughs> and then it doesn't rain and then all the rain disappears and all of a sudden you get like lots of land. But other than that, you're, there's just like, so his poems are sort of about nature because there's a lot, um, they, it's a very rural area. So um, I'm going to read a couple of these poems so that if you do speak another language, in addition to being a writer, it's great that you could also translate other writers and then you learn a lot about um, different ways of writing and different ways of using language. So I'm sure, is, is anyone else here bilingual? Is anyone else here speaking the language other than English? Yeah, what do you speak? Spanish. Oh, Spanish, okay. Do you speak Spanish? Anybody else? I'm Italian. Oh, we can't have a conversation because I'm Italian. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> My skills have been tapped. That's it. Um, anyone else? Any other language you speak? Yeah? That's great. You know, I have a student who is translating the sixth Dalai Lama. Six, you know? He was a poet. A really good poet. You should look him up. His poems are really quite good. Um, anybody else? Yeah? Oh, there's great Vietnamese poetry. Really, really good. So all of you, pressure on. Next year, if we have another translation workshop, you should all bring um, your, translation, your own translations with you. So these are a couple of poems from uh, Manuel de Bajos. This one is called Small World, which in Portuguese would be? <laughs> My world is small, Lord. There is a river and a few trees. The back of our house faces the water. The ants trim grandmother's rose beds. In the backyard, there is a boy and his wondrous tin cans. His eye exaggerates the blue. Everything from this place has a pack with birds. Here, if the horizon reddens a little, the beetles think it's a fire. Where the river starts to fish, River me a thing, river me a frog, river me a tree. In the evenings, an old man plays his lute to invert the sunsets. So a little funny thing that happened when I was translating poems is that he uses the word river as a verb, which you don't do in Portuguese and you don't do in English. But that was what makes it a poem, right, is that you do things with words that we don't usually do. And that's one of the things you can do as writers. You can do funny things by saying, river me a tree, instead of saying, I'm standing next to a river looking at a tree. You can make it more exciting than that. So I was trying you know, to figure out how to do that in English. And it's so interesting because when you do it as a translator, then you get all these ideas, and you get to go and do those things in your own writing. So that makes it, um, that's one of the things for me that I love about translation. That makes you kind of get out of your own habits a little bit. Um, so this, I'll, I'll, read, I'll just read a couple more from, from Bajos. This is the illness. I never lived far from my country. However, I suffer from farness. In my childhood, my mother had the illness. 
She was the one who gave it to me. Later, my father went to work at a place that gave this illness to people. It was a place without a name or neighbors. People said it was the nail on the toe at the end of the world. We grew up with no other houses nearby, a place that offered only birds, trees, a river, and its fish. There were unbridled horses in the scrub grass, their backs covered in butterflies. The rest was just distance. Distance was an empty thing we carried in the eye, what my father called exile. I think I, I love these poems because I have never lived in a swamp. Um, and I have no distance from my neighbors. I can see them cooking through the window, my window to their kitchen. Their meal often looks better than mine. And so I just love spending time with poems because it got you out of your life and you could, you know, imagine myself in this place that had lots of distance and, and things happening in it. Um, so I'm going to skip the next one for the sake of time so we can uh, get to exercises with all of you. And I'm going to read just one more of these poems. It's the portrait of the artist as a thing. Um, because it's about being a writer, which all of you are, so it seemed like a good poem to read to you. There is a vegetal heat in the artist's voice. He'll have to make his language cross-eyed to reach the water's whisper in the leaves. He'll never have the inclination again to reflect on things. He'll have the inclination to be them. He won't have ideas anymore. He'll have rain afternoons, wind fluttering birds. Where the flies govern over the crumbs from lunch, he'll think desertion. The torque of words will extract it from within him. It'll come out drunk from having been. It'll come out drunk and dark, seeing leeches twisted fat pinned to the horse's stomach. The child goes and carves them out. The horse's dark blood runs. The artist must drain that darker substance, must arrive sick from grief, from limitations, his defeats. He will have to make his language cross-eyed to the point of perceiving the sun's perfume in the heron's eye. So we will practice this a little bit today, trying to make your language cross-eyed. I think it is a noble goal. Um, so I'm going to read just a couple poems uh, from my new book, Poems, which is coming out in April. And as uh, Jackie said in her intro, I taught for a number of years at a women's prison uh, in Chelsea. And um, so every week I was coming in and out of a prison and um, thinking about the role that prisons ha have in our society. And maybe some of you know people who are in prison or have been in prison. And I think once you've had experience with a prison, it, it just stays with you and, and you realize what a big part it is of American culture. So um, I'll read this first poem. It's called Civilian Exiting the Facilities. Each week my body is fist stamped and triple scanned before it lands again in the electoral world. My mind takes longer to leave, stays in the elevator considering the kind of crime it might be capable of. Would I have to be hungry? Could it happen over nothing? Could it happen nightly? In the shine of a car outside the prison, my reflection gets wider until it splits. In one likeness, the face I recognize. In the other, my face. The thing is, when you enter prison and you go upstairs, you always get a stamp on your hand when you go up. And, I, and there was like, well, make sure you don't wash the stamp off because then you can't come back out again. And it was, seemed like, oh, gosh, like that's the only thing from keeping yourself in or out of the prison is whether you have the stamp on your hand. And then you realize that that's true for like lots of people in prison. Anyway, so um, I just was very fascinated and then staring at the stamp in coming in and out. It really is one of those things that stays with you, how um, the, way, the way systems like that work. So I'll, I'll just read one more, and then you'll have a couple extra poems in the packet to, to look at later if you want to. This is called Riding By on a Sunday. It's about, I would go on my bike and I would pass the prison where I taught and would know everybody who was inside it. And so it was a strange sensation to drive by this place where I knew all these people were inside all the time because they can't come out. Riding by on a Sunday. Nothing shatters. The day around the prison gleams like the clean face of a spoon. To the man on the bike beside me, I see, I say, see how it blends in the same brick in height disappears after a mile like any other high rise. Only A still sits inside, denied parole again for an assault 23 years ago. And Officer M sits in the annex until 10, stacking the women's IDs according to his ideas of beauty. The faster we go along the river, the more the city tips into background. The blocks become ellipses, each building possibly a prison, possibly a warehouse full of pinwheels. I want to stop longer, but keep peddling. I tell myself, Prisons are inevitable and inevitably awful. Tell myself this thought is just another way of looking away. All day, the river beside us streams the silver of dream hair. So those are a couple poems from, from this new book coming out. But I'm so excited to hear all of your writing. I, I, can't, I can't read anymore. 
So this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to have you do two different kinds of writing, um, and then we're going to talk about where each of them comes from. Okay. So the first writing you're going to do is I want you to just take five minutes. Um, yeah, we'll go like a little after the nine. Where you're going to do a description. You can do it as a poem, or you can do it in prose, whichever comes to you, whichever you want to do, um, of a place you know really, 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 really well. And when you do a description of the place, what are some of the things that you would want to put into it? Any thoughts? Things. Yeah, what it looks like, exactly. Like what it smells like, because as we know in New York, especially in the summer, <laughs> it's a factor. Absolutely. What else? Yeah? What it means to you. What it means to you, exactly. What's, what, what, what associations you have with that place? Does it make you happy to go in there? Does it make you sort of miserable? Is it a place that you avoid? Is it a place you look forward to? Exactly. What does it mean to other people too, right? What it means to you, what does it mean to other people you know or don't know? Exactly. What else would you mind in, in a description of a place you know really well? Who's there? Yeah, and what are they doing there? Exactly. Anything else? What, yeah, why you're doing it. Exactly. So just take, exactly, because, you know, did you wander in there? Is it a place that you choose to go to? Okay, so take five minutes and just describe a place that you know really, really well. What it smells like, what it looks like, what it means to you, what it means to other people, who's there, why, why you're there, and just write a description of a place that you can kind of close your eyes and you can see it, smell it, hear it really, really well. And then, uh, and then we'll talk about it. So what were some of the places you wrote about? Yeah? My room. Your room. Yeah, great. Other places? Yeah? Actually, you wrote about my grandfather's porch in Puerto Rico. Oh. Because you probably uh, sit there a lot so you know what, yeah, what it looks I out on. Yeah, watch people Yeah? I about the Oh, isn't that beautiful? I love that, the Cherry Blossom Festival. It smells so good. <laughs> Talk about good smell. Yeah. I was on the Palm. Oh. And what place exactly? Oh. Wow. Someone, let's, let's hear a couple of these. Do you want to read yours? Oh, okay. Read a little bit of it? Yeah. Wow, great description. Uh, someone else want to read? Someone who? Yeah? Okay. What did you write about? I wrote about, about um, Poesy Street in Phoenix Square. Mm. Because um, my boyfriend used to live around there, so we used to always be around there. Okay. So I put Hong Kong, Kong. Traffic. Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Traffic. Red lights. Every driver desiring the green light. Two little pay extensions to the yellow light. Inhale. <coughs> the smell of roasted peanuts and cigarettes wafted in the air. Blink. Lights are pretty clothes in the window shops. Blink. The lights are still red. Inhale. Cheap perfume. Blink. I see him. Curls bouncing on the top of his head as he walks toward me. Inhale. The smell of his fabric soft and as he hugs me so tight. Mmm. Wow. Great. You can really get the senses in there. That's great. The cheap perfume and the fabric soft and really vivid. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, mine doesn't really have a title either, but it's about the Chinese scholars' garden in Staten Island. Great. <laughs> Let's hear it. Um, five, five subway stops, one ferry ride, and a bus away is my summer. Hmm. Chinese scholars' garden lies within the thick recesses of the city, a place of sincere silence that baffles me to this day. I sit on a stone bench, trace the vines, the green dragons snaking up the smooth walls, count the fireflies buzzing by. I wonder if this is what Lee Paul saw, if he saw the same cicadas chirping through the jaws of time. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's great. Chirping through the time. What a great use of the verb. Just aspire with that use of river. See, so once you start thinking about funny, language gets cross-eyed, and you think of all these great things to do. These are, these are, I'm really excited to hear what happens next. So what you're going to do next is you're going to write about the same place that you wrote about for this first one, but from the perspective of someone who has never been there before and doesn't know anything about it. Okay? 
So same place. Same porch, same garden, same cherry blossom festival. <laughs> Wherever you wrote about before, same square. And someone, you, you can make up the person and have an idea, or you can just have them a vague idea. But what would it be like to be in that same place in your room with someone who um, didn't know anything about the place and had never been there before? How would they see it? What, what would happen when you change the perspective? Okay, so take, so try and see the place again with new eyes. How it smells, sounds, tastes. See what happens. Okay, so what happened when you switched perspective? Was it easier or harder to do? Easier. Easier or harder? Harder in what way? Um, it was harder because um, you, like, you know how you feel about it because you have to put yourself in a different person, so it's like you have to see everything differently, and it's just hard. You, you have to use your what? Imagination. Exactly, right, which is the writer's tool that you it's the key thing, and I think that sometimes we often will write on our own perspective, but it can be a great exercise for your brain to use your imagination by making that leap of seeing something from another perspective. Somebody said they thought it was easier. Who was it? Yeah. Why was it easier? Because I know how stereotypical people would be in my But it also must be that you're really good at thinking about how other people think, yeah. which is a writerly skill. Some people can't do that, but that's like a real leap of imagination to be like, oh, I, I see these people and I can imagine what they're thinking is this, this, and this, right? I mean, that, that's, that's an act of imagination. Not everyone can, can imagine themselves in, in somebody else's way of thinking, which isn't your way of thinking. Yeah? I thought it was easy because I did my bedroom <laughs> and I had friends come over the other day. Yeah. So they were telling me all these things that they didn't expect my room would look like. Oh, so you, 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 had, you had evidence from somebody else of what that experience is like. That's great. Yeah? I found it easier to be grouchy and critical than positive because then I worry about being too flowery. This mm. is a place I really love and I can sound really silly when I talk about it. So it's almost more fun to be on the other side. Yeah, it can be really freeing yeah. to write in a, as somebody that you're not. I mean, that's the cool thing about writing is that you don't even have to be a person. I mean, you could look at the botanical gardens as a bird who's come to visit for the, you know, the cherry blossom bus or as a bee. I mean, you can always even do a perspective that isn't even necessarily a human's perspective. And that's really freeing. I mean, you think all these books that have come out, people who are looking at things in the perspective of their dogs. There must be something really freeing about that because people love these books. So we all seem to really want to be in the minds of not only other people, but even other species. So um, yes, I, I maybe I should have asked you all to do that from the perspective of a, a non-human person. That would be that would be, that would be hard. Um, anyone else find it harder, easier, or just were, were surprised by what happened? Yeah. Well, I felt like it's um, because I wrote about my fire escape, so I feel like I have these sort of romantic ideas about it. But I think most people would have like certain reactions to it that are less than. Know, certain like more obvious reactions to it. So that's sort of easier, like, oh, it's illegal to be here and it's going to fall down and it's filled with like just things that are much easier to Yeah. But it, it, it's an interesting thing to, to, to ask your mind to do that because I think that's such a key part of writing, regardless of what genre you like writing and best, and you can obviously write more than one, is that act of sort of seeing things from, from more than one perspective and what happens to the place. Yeah. I thought it was easier because this was a place that's kind of gross. And actually, I think imagine to an outsider the first time a stronger reaction where to me I'm kind of used to it. So I think it's actually easier to describe to someone else if they're walking in and going, oh my god, whereas I'm just kind of like, I I feel that way about my kitchen. I was like, oh gosh, what do people think when they walk in? <laughs> Why are there 20 cereal boxes on the counter? What, what's going on? Yeah. I like to because you can sort of have the opportunity to strip away all of your own emotional right. reactions to it, all the ghosts that are in these places and all those sorts of things. And to imagine coming into somewhere new with the fresh eyes bird of my college uh, library. <laughs> and so uh, like all the things that happened there, to strip those away and imagine like walking in for the first time again. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the neat things about being a writer is that you can see things for the first time again. Yeah. And that, you know, and so sometimes maybe you get tired of writing about the places that you know, and you can see them again by seeing them as somebody else, which means that you can never run out of material. Someone says, I don't have anything to write about. You're like, no, you should just write as somebody else. 
And then you can see all the places again through, through noise. So let's hear a couple of these, um, these versions of somebody else. Someone want to read? Yeah, let's hear about your, your friend's take on your room. Yeah. Messy, stinks of cheap orange perfume. <laughs> Too many stuffed animals. How can every last one have a different name? <laughs> Two beds, one to sleep on, fine. But another just to display all those silly toys? Too much. Very messy. Walls painted, not painted. Three colors, make a choice. <laughs> Too many random things. Yarn, yarn, yarn. A whole drawer of yarn. Make up your mind, are you five or eighty? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, you're 16 and a total freak. But that's why we love you. Now get, <laughs> now get the stuffed animals off the floor. <laughs> you have such a great sense of voice. You could really hear the voice of, of a person. I think mean, we talk about that, I'm sure, in other workshops. We talk about voice. And sometimes getting your own voice is one thing, but to be able to really get the voice of other people and, and have that consistency of voice, that's great. That was a lot of fun. Someone, someone else had a hand up. Yeah, you want to read? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the black paint, is it even paint? Has a propensity for getting everywhere. It is as though the rickety iron skeleton had intentionally been painted over with filth. There are trees around, a surprising touch that no one is really supposed to see this place. Trees that exist completely independent from the human gaze. Of course, the dominant emotion is one of fear. Even the fire, every fire escape, even on new buildings, with, of which one, wait, even on new buildings, which this is not, feels indescribably ancient and infirm, senile. It is a peaceful echo of the fires a century ago, stuck onto the side in memory of the flaming human parachutes floating slowly down against the blue afternoon sky. Wow, that's that's a fire escape I've ever heard one. That was great. Wonderful. Anyone else want to read? We haven't heard from yet? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I walk two steps in a bright circle and not need happiness. Pink flowers, kids, and food. I like to try, more or less. Dot, dot, dot. What do I see? People with sores dressed like a cat. Teenagers cheering, Naruto, Naruto. And weirdos go. Dot, dot, dot. Now what do I see? Japanese costumes and what looks like a dog in a kimono. Is it so? Maybe that should they call me. Weird Asha, I say. <laughs> Sweet smells and giggles by the red gum tree. Oh boy, the festival is really something to see. Great! Because I think if you've been to the festival every year, the fact that all these people come in these crazy costumes, you sort of get used to it. But at the first time you go, because I went with some friends from Brazil this past year, and they were all like, get the fuck like They were just like, it's really strange. <laughs> you sort of think you're going to see the flowers, and there's all these people who are dressed up. You know, it is, it is a funny, funny day. Um, I saw another hand over here. Yeah, go ahead. This room knows the art of lying. It's been innocent that laughs underneath the crack of the door and braces me, and yet this deceiving room has fooled me. A pile of clothes rests at the foot of the bed, thrown together on top of something that will always remain a mystery. The dog rests its body on a mountain of fallen clothes that have been exiled out of the closet but stay close enough to taste their old position from the old hangers. Straight paper is littered the desk and the floor. Sloppy handwriting is scrawled effortlessly effortlessly across the lines, forcing curiosity to read the words and frustration that it would be impossible to understand. Great, really vivid description. That was great, wow. Well, um, is anyone else itching to read or should we talk about it a little more? Anyone, any, one last reader out there? No? All right, so I, I, what, I, what are some things you might take away from this in terms of thinking about perspective and switching, switching mindsets when you're writing about things? Anyone have any thoughts when you're thinking about it? Things you're, yeah? It's easy to switch when you're doing a place you know really well. It just makes it that much more, you're, you know that place so well, you can, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. But I think what people don't realize is how freeing it is sometimes to not be yourself, to be friends coming into your room, or so you can be kind of grouchy about a place you love and imagine not liking it, or you can look at it from the eyes of like your dog or your neighbor's dog or the bee at the blog festival or something like that because it, it can be really freeing to, to look at a place with new eyes. So I think sometimes when you're going into writing, sometimes your default position is to write as yourself, but it can actually be freeing and really exciting to switch it up and, and, and be somebody else. Um, which I think is why I love translating because I think it gets me out of myself a little bit. So those of you who do have other languages, it's a great way to sort of do exactly what we 
just did, but where you actually have somebody else's words, and then you come back to your own writing and you feel like, instead of being in Brooklyn, I got to be in this amazing swamp listening to the rain and looking in a river, and then all of a sudden I came back to English and I was like, oh, I'm back in Brooklyn, you know? So it, it's a really nice, especially if you miss a place that you know or that you want to go back there in your mind, it's a great, it's a great way to do that. Um, so anyway, so we should leave a couple minutes for questions, I think, that, um, yeah. Oh yeah, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Oh, um, I know that there are a lot of lexical gaps between different languages, so when you're translating a language, do you ever feel like you put your own spin on the poem? That's a good question. I guess the thing is, is that language and poetry, maybe less so with prose, it's all about what you do with the language and the rhythm and, and things like that. So I try and not put my own music into the poem, but sometimes the way that the music happens in Portuguese or in Spanish isn't the, how, isn't the way music happens in English. What sounds to our ears like music in English isn't necessarily what sounds to our ears like a musical writing in another language. So as long as you have to kind of recreate what, what the music does. But I think that's fun because it, then the question becomes what? What is music in English? What words sound beautiful to us? What words don't sound beautiful to us? Because sometimes certain rhymes, if you're just like, the far car um, is going you know, um, to, the, to the bar, that sounds like a kid's book, right? Also doesn't make any sense. But the point is, is that it doesn't, it, it sounds like a children's, something for children. So then it's like, okay, well, what kind of music is, 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 is exciting and interesting to us as, as, as writers who are further along in the way we hear things? So then you don't, and, and maybe in other languages, you can have those full rhymes that sound, that work. But I think for American readers of poetry in 2010, that doesn't work. So you have to find ways to make the, what we call a slant rhyme or an off rhyme or half rhyme, where it's like, it would be like black and block, because you can hear that the consonants are the same, but it's not black and jack. So you're like, oh, black block, that's interesting to us. And you hear the music, but you don't feel like you're reading Dr. Seuss. Does that make sense? So I, I they're interesting questions because it makes you think about what what is beautiful to our ears, you know, as as writers or readers now. Anyone else have questions? No. I yeah. <laughs> um, when since you work in translation a lot from yeah. languages that you know, and this is a little bit alluding to what we're going to be doing later on in the workshop, do you ever make translations or draw translations from text that you are unfamiliar with or that you don't know? Um, the language is unfamiliar and maybe you're doing just sound or... Well, well, when you do translation, it's only by the sound. It's called a homophonic translation, but then you're really talking about what we would call a version, because it's a version of the poem, as opposed to a translation. It's not really representing the original. So I think, when we use the word translation, I think in general, and when you go to a bookstore, and let's say you're going to read Don Quixote. Did anyone ever have to read Don Quixote for school? Um, yeah. <laughs> it, Everything is nice. Right, yeah. Well, so anyway, when you go to read Don Quixote, that is not a homophonic translation. Someone is really, um, hopefully you get the Edith Grossman translation, because it's great. It's somebody who actually is trying to represent what's happening in Spanish, right? So when you're doing that, um, you have to know the language. And if you're going to do a translation where you're just hearing the sounds, what you're really doing is making a poem of your own, which is really exciting fun, and I have done that. But I think it's like a, it's a different kind of motive. It's sort of like when you're writing for, um, you want to actually convey the place to someone, or you're writing because you're in love with the sound of a word. Like I think it's just kind of like a different, a different, a different kind of, a different kind of writing. So um, yeah, I like doing both, but I think because I love this, how freeing it is to kind of get out of my brain and, and get to be some man living in the swamps of Brazil. I will never be a man living in the swamps of Brazil, and so it's <laughs> great to be able to do that for a little while instead of being a woman in Brooklyn. I mean, I love being a woman in Brooklyn, you know. But I'm just saying, it's nice to have the variety. So that's why I like to do that. Any other questions? Yeah. How did you start translating poems? I don't know. I asked myself that. I'm like, why do I do this crazy thing? Um, I think what happened was I, I graduated from college and I moved to Chile because I had done a semester abroad there, which I think is a great thing if anyone, when you're in college, you have the opportunity to do that. So I moved back and was teaching English and working as uh, a translator for a newspaper there. But it wasn't literary translation. I was just translating articles for this, for this newspaper. And I realized that I really liked it, but I didn't like translating news. I, I, so I went to bookstores, and I would find all these books I wanted to read, and I, and I wanted to read them better, and so then I started translating for myself, mm -hmm. and then started sending them to journals, and they took them, and there's a lot of grants out there for translation, which is great, so I've, got, I've gotten like, I can pay my rent from it, so that's really nice. <laughs> I get to work on my own poems. It just kind of happened, and I think that happens as writers. You kind of just have to follow the things that work out, 
you know? And it worked out. I don't know. It's one of those things. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, in translation, they talk about this thing that was sort of like whether you're going to sort of Portuguese eyes the English, you know, or you're going to English eyes the Portuguese. And so I think the thing is, is what's cool about translation, which I try to do in these bajos, is to bring some of his sensibility from Brazil and from Portuguese into English. So the idea is exactly that, that that strangeness is wonderful, that strangeness is beautiful. And I think that you don't want to kill that strangeness by turning it into you know, a description of the subway if it's a description of somewhere else. And I think, um, Marcela, you really did that really well when you were reading about the, that patio, because I think you were using all these words in English, but you threw in café con leche. You know, we got the coconut, and so you can find words or something that maybe throw in. Like, for example, you probably shouldn't be drinking caipirinha, but if you were drinking uh, yeah. caipirinha, you know, it's like this drink that everyone has in Brazil, but we all know how good it is, right? You know, so then it's like, it's, it's, it's part of something that you can say, or samba, or, or you know, carnaval, or, or something like that. So I think that there are ways that you can bring some of that other culture into, into your writing, and you shouldn't leave it out, because I think that's what makes English beautiful, is that you can bring the Brazil and the Portuguese to English, you know? So that's your task, is to sort of figure out how to, how to keep it in there, not take it out. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Anyone have one of your last question? Yeah. Um, because Spanish and along with the other romantic languages, because they're like so sexual and you always have to have, like when you speak those romantic languages, your mouth is open all the time as opposed to speaking English where it's more like scientific. Do you ever find yourself in translating any poems from English or to any other romantic language, like just seeing that difference? Really? That happens a lot. I think it happens um, in, in with Portuguese. There are a lot of sexual innuendos, sort of like references to sex, which are like in the poems, but they're not explicit. Like you, you wouldn't say, "Oh, there it is. That's a sexy line." But you know, it's a sexy line. You know. So then, what do you do? Because English. We just, you know, we don't have as many sexy lines. Or you, it's, it's a little awkward in English, all the sexy lines. In Brazil, <laughs> or, in, or in Latin American poetry, there's just like a lot of sexy lines, you know? And they're just there, and everyone thinks it's funny, and you just kind of roll with it. So I don't know, I try. Sometimes I feel like I'm kind of combing out some of the sexiness, but I don't think it would work as well in English. But sometimes I keep it in, and I have to kind of like turn up the volume on it so people will get it, you know? And that's fun too, because then I get to write things. I myself don't write particularly sexy poems. I write poems about prison. So that's <laughs> not so sexy, right? Not so sexy. So when I'm, when I'm translating, it's fun because then I get to be this person who's like writing these sexy lines in English, and that's great. So I think it's freed me up a lot to, to do that because it's true. I feel like people sort of talk about the body differently, not even necessarily sexiness, but like yeah. just talking about body parts and, and, and people, how what they look like and, and how they feel. Like I think it is, it's, it's a different. And I think that that's a great thing to bring into English because we need people talking about having their bodies. Like sometimes I think in English we're so detached from our, we're just like floating brains. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that we're out of time for the crack talk, so can we thank you, Josh?